and it's my great pleasure to introduce Lisa Badner. Her poems and other writing have appeared in print and online publications, including Rattle, The New Ohio Review, Triquarterly, Mudlark, Pank, Mom Egg, Ping Pong, The Satirist, Fourteen Hills, and others. Lisa's poem, This Is Not an Obituary, received special, special mention in Pushcart 2017. Lisa directs the Writer's Studio Tutorial Program as in, and is in Phillips um, Schultz's Wednesday Masterclass. Welcome, Lisa. Okay. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read is Taxi Court. Uh, so Taxi Court. They call me judge. Talk about hacks and specs, seizures and blues. It all eludes me. A limo driver says, it's conspiracy, medallions, and cops. Takes off his shoe. In my country, this means I tell the truth. He licks the bottom. <laughs> they read taxi news and look at their watches. The decisions pile up while I try passwords on the computer. Down and out, one, two, three. Ne'er do well, four, five, six. <laughs> Finally, I hate law, 789, gets me in. I find everybody guilty. <laughs> Watching adoption video with my eight-year-old. After a particularly shitty day in school, learning about immigration and then fighting with me about reading logs, Minecraft, and Hebrew school, my son wants to watch his adoption video again given to us six and a half years earlier by the Ethiopian social workers. In the video, my son sees the hut he lived in and his birth mother, cows, a farm, an old grandmother. The movie culminates in meeting his adoptive mother, me. He is not even two, but he's already my kid. The Ethiopian courts had declared it. All I'd seen before was a picture of his face. Filmed by Elias, the cameraman at the Musa Center in Addis Ababa, my son and I watch as the adoptive mother, me, doesn't know how to pronounce her son's name. She is smiling like a nervous idiot. She tries to hold the boy and he cries. He has no interest in the bubble wand in her hand. You see, he tells me in our living room in Brooklyn, now sitting on my lap, you are a stranger, some random person. So these next two are about two, two dead friends from the 1980s. Eric, my dead friend. When I was 20, I cried to my best friend Eric that my life was a huge failure. A few years older, Eric told me it would all work out. We smoked cigarettes and drank Pepsi all night. We made out, that was awkward. Eric <laughs> was a feminist, sensitive, joined Men Stopping Rape cried when he watched the news, tried to be gay, he told me, less misogynist. We went to women's music concerts together and lectures about pornography. Then he finished his PhD and got weird, distant, worked all the time, never wanted to chat, didn't seem so feminist anymore, wrote lots of articles I couldn't understand. They were quantitative. He kept smoking. Eric was famous, well, in an academic kind of way. I decided I wasn't going to call him anymore, and he never called me. I wanted to tell him, fuck you for not calling. Vicki, 1960 to 2017. Vicki was lovers with Claudia, my professor. It was the early 80s. She was getting her PhD and was my TA. But then, after a couple of years, she called me her best friend though she was always drinking beer, and per my recollection, I didn't tell her very much. In the late 80s, when she and Claudia were not getting along, Vicky invited me to take a self-defense class with her. It was called Chimera. It was a miserable time, as I was supposed to scream a guttural no when I, <laughs> when I kicked in the knee of the imaginary assailant, but nothing would come out. The teacher, a little powerhouse named Nancy Newton, told stories of how she was terribly abused held hostage, tortured by various husbands or boyfriends. I told Vicky I didn't trust Nancy, but really, 
I was secretly jealous of Nancy's rich, fucked up life. And Nancy paid no attention to me at all. Vicky and Nancy moved in together and moved to Florida and then to North Carolina when Vicky got, where Vicky got a big academic job. Before she moved, Vicky and I had a big fight. I told her she was wasting her life with Nancy. She told me that I had debunked feminist theory and she wouldn't write me a letter of recommendation. <laughs> it turned out Nancy's stories were all fabricated. So Nancy went back to Florida to be a dog groomer. Vicky accumulated greyhounds and drank with the locals. Vicky and I didn't speak for 25 years until recently when Claudia was dying of cancer. By then, Vicky had switched from beer to vodka. Vicky was the only person to leave me messages on my work phone, even on the weekends. In April of 2017, she called, and I owed her a phone call, which I kept putting off for the right time where I could listen for a long time while cleaning the house or washing dishes. Just a couple more. <laughs> the poem I shouldn't have, I should never have written and it was published with a couple of the other ones as, as nobody put a gun to my head. So the, it's a working title. I wrote a poem last year that I wish I didn't write, an embarrassing poem about allow, allowing this older adult guy to violate me, in a sense, when I was a teen, something I never talk about. But when, 30 years later, that very same guy's girlfriend from 30 years ago ends up as my kid's teacher, I saw the art of the situation. The irony was delicious and repulsive. So I wrote a poem. I should have deleted the poem or at least filed it away. I sent the poem out to magazines. What would be the chances? The, po the poem was published. And now I can't take it back. Nobody put a gun to my head. I hide the, contribu the contributor copies I pretend it doesn't exist. I look on Twitter. The poem was tweeted. I block the tweet. An email from the editor arrives in my inbox. A superb poem was the feedback, he writes. I delete the email. OK, just two more. OK. Phone call from ex-therapist. She was my object relation for 13 years, my rapprochement, my transference, my borderline bouncing board, until I could no longer afford even the rent-controlled equivalent to therapy. So when a text message appears on my phone from, an ex, from my ex-therapist saying we have to talk, I get a lump in my throat. Does she have cancer? She is in her 60s. Is she dying? Or maybe she wants to break barriers, be my friend. I mean, she had counter-transference, too. <laughs> I met someone, she says. I mean, really met someone. She doesn't have cancer. <laughs> she continues, the someone lives in Canada, the someone is younger than I am, the someone is a lawyer, doesn't practice, is a little overweight, sexy, though, very smart. I am clearly not the intended recipient of this call. I think I should say something. I don't. I want to hear more as badly as I don't want to hear more. My ex-therapist is talking about herself like we're two teenage girlfriends in the locker room. This is wrong, but I can't stop it. For 13 years, I sleuthed her life, figured out where she lived and with whom. Now she's talking about the sex. And I am shrinking into my broken dining room chair, feigning a smile she can't see. I should be sitting on her leather couch on East 5th Street talking about me, about my deteriorating relationship, my depleting self-esteem, and how I've managed these eight years with no therapist, and how I really wish I had one I could call right now. <laughs> This is my last poem. Mr. Beagleman. Mr. Beagleman, why did you let me audition for all those plays? <laughs> Finian's Rainbow, Hair, Fiddler on the Roof, Godspell, till I was 13, never getting a part. <laughs> Belting out my country tis of thee. A cappella, in my wispy voice, alone, on stage, 
in the big auditorium, and you, Mr. Beagleman, with your clipboard nodding in the third row every year, every play, same song. <laughs> Thank you.